welcome, 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 friends. Welcome to another episode of our favorite podcast. Well, it's my favorite podcast because it's the only one I do on the way home. We're so glad you're joining us again this week. And listen, you will not be disappointed. We have an amazing uh, international guest with us today. Before we get to that guest, I want to tell you a little bit about the two organizations that put this podcast together. Of course, my name is Michael Braithwaite. I'm the CEO of Blue Door, one of the organizations behind this. Blue Door does great grassroots work up in the region of York, uh, the region of Durham and Peel, really kind of the upper uh, greater Toronto area above Toronto. And we do that in the areas of housing, health and homelessness and employment. We have a construction social enterprise that really prevents homelessness by giving people well-paying and meaningful jobs. We connect them. We work with our healthcare partners to connect them to healthcare and say, hey, listen, if uh, people don't have healthcare, they may not uh, keep housing that we fight so hard to get them uh, over time. Um, and we have emergency housing, we have transitional housing, we have long-term housing with all sorts of different wraparound supports for seniors, for men, for families, for youth. And uh, recently we opened up the first two SLGBTQ plus uh, transitional housing unit called Inclusion, like an N-I-N-N, an inclusion in York region, the only one north of Toronto. And that has been very successful and a great example of how partnerships work. We don't do it all on our own. Uh, we lean on all of our partners doing great work to wrap services around our clients. And of course, we do this podcast with the Canadian Alliance and Homelessness. They are a national organization doing great work across this country, lending resources even just around the world. They have a massive conference coming up soon in November. If you haven't signed up yet, sign up now. You want to be there. It's the largest of its kind with guest speakers from all around the world uh, talking about all sorts of very relevant topics that will help you know, define the challenges, define the solutions, much like this podcast uh, uh, does on a weekly basis. You don't want to miss it. Check that out at caeh.ca. And as well, check out all the different training that they offer too, uh, from Built for Zero and on and on and on. If you want to be a Built for Zero community, go to caeh.ca. Check that out. They are amazing and doing great work. Now let's get to today's guest. Uh, I often talk about the connection of health and homelessness. Of course, they intersect all the time. We once had uh, Dr. Sandy Bachman here, who was the head of the Canadian Medical Association, say, if you gave me your postal code, I could probably tell you what your health situation is. Um, and so you, you see the interconnection, um, and we certainly see that too. During the pandemic, when uh, we had individuals coming in and we got the immediate medical attention through a nurse, we triaged that. We saw how much more successful we were in finding them housing. So today's guest, Dr. Howard Coe, we're so happy to have him. Um, he is a professor of practice of public health leadership, health policy and management at Harvard University. So Dr. Howard Coe serves as Assistant Secretary for Health of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2009 to uh, 2014 under President Barack Obama uh, and as Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts from 1997 to 2003. He's a graduate of Yale College and the Yale University School of Medicine. He's earned board certifications in four medical fields, because three wasn't enough, have published more than 300 articles and received over 70 awards, including six honorary doctorate degrees. Wow. Uh, he is the keynote speaker who is speaking today, um, October 13th, for the Lewis L. Odette family lecture taking place uh, in Toronto, I think it's at St. Mike's. Um, and listen, that lecture series is incredible. Every year they have great speakers. Uh, last year they had our friend, Dr. Yua Kakinen from Finland, talking about how they're ending homelessness there. This year they have Dr. Ko. I don't know how they do it. They get amazing speakers uh, every year. Um, and, and, you know, this year is, is, uh, is, is going to be another uh, great uh, addition to the series. Dr. Ko, welcome to the podcast. Michael, thank you so much for having me. What a great honor to join you today. We, we start the conversation always with the same question because it's a little different for everyone. There's similar themes, but it's very personal. Um, and that is the question of what does home mean to you? Home means a place uh, that we all need and treasure where you feel secure, where you feel comforted and loved. It's a place that you can always go to in a time of need and stress. 
And Michael, the fact that we have so many thousands in Canada and the U.S. around the world who don't have a regular home is just unacceptable. And it's an increasingly visible humanitarian crisis. So to be able to join you today and talk about this is a great honor. I also want to start by thanking St. Michael's Foundation, St. Michael's Hospital, and the Odette family for inviting me here today. I've already forged some great partnerships with my colleagues here in Toronto and Canada. So I'm looking forward to more collaborations in the future. Fantastic. And let me tell you, Lou Odette uh, is a friend of the podcast for the Odette family. He's an incredible uh, individual. Uh, so glad that you're a part of that. Um, and we, we agree. I mean, uh, we have a crisis across the country that many will tell us and many who have come on this podcast have talked about how it was a result of bad policy choices in the early 90s and why homelessness always existed. It didn't go into crisis mode till those policy decisions were made, kind of launching people. And in Canada, uh, the federal government got out of, they were building thousands and thousands of social housing units per year and stopped doing that. We just saw our numbers climb, climb, climb. Um, so, so yeah, we're in the midst of this, this crisis. And it's interesting, we had a, a Toronto councillor last week was speaking and said, you know, it didn't really grab the headlines until it started to affect the middle class. So now we're seeing where, you know, before it was just our most vulnerable, this housing piece. Now we're seeing the middle class, as you said, you know, it, it, it's been a crisis for years, but because now it's affecting the middle class, we're, we're seeing it grab the headlines and in our municipal elections that are happening in Toronto and other municipalities uh, throughout Ontario, uh, it definitely is uh, a point of contention for, for all candidates. Um, so, so you're doing the lecture uh, with, I, I can't believe your, your wealth of experience. Um, you, you could be doing so many different things, Dr. Koa. Uh, what has driven you to focus on the work that you're doing and what we'll you're speaking on uh, today? Well, aren't you nice to ask me? And of course, it always starts with the question, why, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, in my career as a physician and public health professional, I've had the pri privilege of attacking and addressing many public health crises that uh, face our society. You know, I trained in medicine and cancer. I got involved uh, in tobacco control, still a major passion and interest for me. And then I got to see how substance use in general affects people's lives. And then when you have the privilege of being a state health commissioner like I have through 9-11 and anthrax, by the way, and then being uh, a U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health through the Affordable Care Act and the last pandemic, H1N1, by the way, uh, you, you get to think about what is health and how do we help all people reach uh, their so-called highest attainable standard of health. But through it all, Michael, I just saw too many people not coming anywhere close to living uh, their full potential for health. And people who are homeless, uh, unfortunately, rank at the top of that list. I'll never forget um, when I was the state health commissioner now, 20 years ago, there was one terrible January. It was a very harsh winter and a dozen people who were homeless froze to death on the streets of Boston. I, I will never forget that. And the advocates were livid, appropriately so. The, the press was all over it. And uh, the stakeholders and the advocates all came to state government and said, who, who is in charge for making sure that people don't freeze to death during this winter? And I was the state health commissioner at the time. I looked above me in government and, uh, you know, this was not a priority for uh, the people above me in government. I mean, there were many other things to take care of, you know, uh, to their defense. So I, I said, OK, I'm going to form a statewide task force and we're going to bring people together with a single goal of preventing people from freezing to death over the next couple of months. So that task force went on for a number of years. You know, I'm not sure we made dramatic progress in solving the homelessness crisis, but at least I think we improved coordination, data sharing, trust building, capacity building. And I think we prevented more people from dying back then. You know, one of the challenges, Michael, which I started thinking about back then was there was, there was so little research, so little reliable data and ordinarily, you turn to academia to help you out and do research and get us to better policy. But the, but in academia, this is an area that is generally not studied well uh, by uh, professors because funding is not there. And uh, so no support systems are there for junior faculty who want to start in. And then, Michael, maybe I should just say, since it's all personal, <laughs> my daughter Dr. Katie Coe is a psychiatrist, and she's a street psychiatrist for the homeless in Boston. So I'm very 
proud of her and proud to work with her on these issues now. But looking at the world from her eyes, I said, okay, we, we got to do more here to tackle the problem and make sure that academia is training future leaders and educating our students and inspiring research. So we started our initiative at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health several years ago, uh, still a pilot initiative. And I guess that caught the attention of the Odette family. So here I am. So <laughs> that's my story briefly. Uh, I did want to mention you have a great homelessness leader here, Dr. Steve Huang, uh, who I think was also responsible for my invitation. So I want to acknowledge him as well. Yeah, so we're very fortunate to have uh, Steve doing the work he's doing. So interesting, you mentioned your daughter as well. I think I hear there another podcast guest in the future. Would love to uh, to pick her brain from from that end of things. And we are glad you're here. Now, you mentioned, and we've I mentioned as well. We keep referring to a housing crisis, right? What defines it as a crisis, and and why do you think it's so often ignored? Well, when you stop and think about it, we, we all wrestle with housing issues, and especially in this time of rising inflation, rising housing costs, and rising rents, uh, these stresses affect literally everybody. But if you're impoverished, extremely low income, and you're looking for affordable housing in particular, the mismatch between supply and demand is particularly stark. And then uh, all you need is a little bad luck, you know, uh, loss of uh, income, loss of a job, uh, loss of a loved one through uh, death or divorce, perhaps, uh, a catastrophic uh, illness or diagnosis, and then a very particularly the loss of your emotional well-being through mental illness and substance use. And then all those forces can converge and cause the homelessness crisis that we're seeing, not only in Canada, not only in the U.S., but so many places around the world. So the discussion often starts with the disconnect between supply and demand in affordable housing, but it goes much, much deeper than that, as you alluded to in your very nice uh, introductory comments, Michael. Absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned this before. So so when I first started in this field about 12 years ago, I, the number one question I would always get from the region when we said, hey, we need funds, we need to tackle this, they would say, well, how many? How many people? How many people? So where's the data? And the data simply wasn't there. And I have to tell you a, a quick funny story. So I'm like, all right, so they need data. So I looked at what we were saying in Canada at that time was – the number of people experiencing homelessness. I took the population of York region. Uh, I, I just, what they called Mike, Michael math. And I broke it down, how many youth or whatever. We came up with a number and, like, and we would use an estimated 300. And that was dangerous because people started quoting that number as a fact, right? That wasn't research. That was four minutes of math based on estimates. But we needed something. But people needed something to hold on to. So when you mentioned that too, when you said uh, academia before, that sometimes it's just underfunded, uh, what role does academia in your mind play in preventing and ending this homelessness crisis? Um, and and uh, what has to change so that role can be kind of played in fully? So you, great, uh, you, you cite a great example, Michael. Let, let's just start with a very basic question. How many people are homeless in Toronto or in Canada or in the U.S.? How many people are dying? You know, the trend's going up or down and what interventions work or don't work. Michael, right now, we can't confidently answer any of those questions because let's start, we, we don't even really precisely know how many people are homeless. Well, let's just start with how we generate those numbers. I mean, you, you tried valiantly, it sounds like, but the best method we have to date, which is really not acceptable, is we have a so-called point in time count, both in Canada and the US. So that's a number that's generated by volunteer, volunteers literally going out one night and counting people. But you can imagine the margin of error that is just enormous. And so, and then if you ask the, the even more fundamental question, how many people who are experiencing homeless die, trying to get that data is also extremely difficult. So just making sure that our definitions of how we count somebody as homeless are aligned, uh, how we get good databases, how we get good tracking, surveillance, and monitoring. You know, only then can we really 
determine whether things are getting better or worse. And so, um, Michael, in our country, maybe you can tell me more about Canada, but you know, we, we look to our National Institutes of Health, NIH, to do funding for a lot of this. They have 27 institutes. I worked very closely with the NIH when I was in the Obama administration. And we have a National Institute for Cancer, a Cancer Institute uh, for Heart, Lung, and Blood, for diabetes. But we don't have them for vulnerable populations like uh, people experiencing homelessness. So that's, I think, a root problem right now for academia. I mean, the vision I am hoping, uh, Michael, in collaboration with my colleagues in Toronto and elsewhere, is that the more academia can pay attention to this, the more we can even have courses for our students so, so they can see the crisis that's happening literally right outside their walls, uh, the more we can motivate young people to go into this field and do cutting edge research, uh, the more we can partner with policymakers so that decisions are evidence-based. I think the be that's gonna make us all healthier in the future. I wanna dig a little deeper on that um, because I think the academic community plays a huge part. We're very fortunate in Canada as well to have something called the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, the Homeless Hub, uh, led by my, my good friend, Dr. Stephen Gates. Mm -hmm. and, and it's fun for the longest time. I mean, that was, if you needed a stat or a study or anything, they were the go-to. And that's a lot of pressure to put one or, through York University uh, in uh, in Toronto. But how do we go about building uh, this, this academic community that will address uh, the neglected world health and homelessness through education, research, and, um, and translation? Well, thank you for mentioning the Homeless Hub, because I had the pleasure of going on it and looking around, and I really admire the work of you and your colleagues, uh, Michael, in setting that up. The data sharing, the um, informing one another of uh, resources and options and experience, the, just the connections and building an academic network is just critically important. I mean, I think step one in all this, it's so basic, is just demonstrating that there are other people who care about this and want to do it right, because it's just easier to take uh, the other route, which is just try to pretend it doesn't exist. And that's clearly not working anywhere in Canada or the US. So I'm hoping that, for example, uh, with our new pilot initiative at Harvard, we started a, a dedicated course on health and homelessness several years ago. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, Drs. Maggie Sullivan and Jill Roncarati for starting that. Before that, Michael, we, we never had a course on health and homelessness at our school, which is an outstanding place. And uh, so if we can at least have every university and especially school of public health have a dedicated course on this and make this just part of the core curriculum, because in a time of COVID, in a time of climate change, uh, th this is yet another crisis that's going to be with us for a long, long time. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, sometimes I have to be honest, sometimes it, uh, it, it can be quite overwhelming, especially as of late. Every time we, we take a look at the news, there's some inflation, climbing, housing prices, all these things you mentioned as well, right? Where we're like, and, and I remember we had uh, Dr. Nick Falbo come on, who's a Canadian researcher, and, and it was probably a year and a half into the um, into uh, COVID. He said, you know, he said, we won't see the worst impacts of the pandemic on our most vulnerable until three years after. Because he said so many people are still trying to work on the resources they have. It won't be till then that they're, they've exhausted those and we'll really see the hardest impact. Uh, so we're, we're kind of a, a year or so out of it. And, and he, what he was saying is, is definitely coming true. Um, so, so you're speaking today with a Odette lecture, uh, a great series. Uh, what, what role do you think uh, series like the Odette lecture series play in addressing these types of difficult issues? Uh, how do they help? Well, thank you. I, I think the Odette Lecture is providing an incredibly important service. Uh, first, I think in a time of COVID to underscore the message that we are one human community, that uh, you know we are not healthy unless all of us have some shot at being healthy. Um, also, I think it underscores the message that there are no easy fixes to this and every sector of society has got to step up and do more. Uh, we need a more urgent and unified response to this crisis. Now, lots of people have tried, you know, in the housing world and in the health world and in the economics world, uh, in the mental health services world, uh, but we now have to 
do even more to be unified and working with each other. So I'm a public health professor. And in my view, the, the public health perspective is particularly important because we're used to interdisciplinary challenges. I mean, every sector, whether you're in housing or in education or you're a faith-based leader or you're a healthcare provider, you got to step up, do more and build even stronger non-traditional partners here. So I think all those groups, and I can say philanthropy has a huge role while we try to push government to fund this uh, more seriously. I mean, every sector can contribute to this. And then, Michael, if I can say, I think every family uh, struggles with some of these risk factors. And I'm sure some people listening here are wrestling with these issues in their own extended family. So th this is quite personal for all of us. Absolutely. I remember a stat in the 2017 um, Youth Homelessness Survey that uh, the Homeless Hub did. And they said 80% of youth said they entered into homelessness uh, because of family breakdown. So to your point of how personal it could be, you could be going along in life, a divorce, a death in the family, mental health or, or addictions, something happening in the family, and boom, that family's blown apart, right? And, and circumstances change rapidly. Uh, so, so yeah, absolutely. I think it, it affects us all. Uh, some, of course, more than others. But that family breakdown piece, uh, quite often we get asked, uh, I think people assume there's a big assumption that all homelessness is around addiction and mental health. And while that plays a large part, we can't neglect the family breakdown piece of how people uh, find their path into homelessness. Now, we quite often hear, of course, in your world too, uh, the need for evidence-based kind of our evidence-based work, our evidence-based interventions. Can you talk about the need for evidence-based interventions uh, to end this homelessness crisis uh, within the context of, of the pandemic? Sure, Michael. And maybe I can just uh, thank you for bringing up the personal vulnerability themes of homelessness and mention those uh, key examples because it's too easy to consider this somebody else's problem and that perspective, unfortunately, has contributed to making people who are experiencing homelessness some of the most marginalized and stigmatized people in our society. And so we're not going to solve this unless we give people the, the uh, respect they need and deserve as they struggle to get back on their feet. Now, having this conversation through COVID is a very challenging because we all saw what COVID did to our health generally, and especially for vulnerable populations. You know, I, I like to point out that, you know, we all have our COVID stories about how the pandemic disrupted our lives. But, you know, how do you socially distance when you're trying to eke out an existence in a crowded shelter? You know, how do you follow a stay-at-home order if you don't have a home to go to? That was your first question you asked me. So there's some fundamental issues here, and, and even more pressing societal question is that in a time of crisis, like a pandemic, who is responsible for caring for the most vulnerable? So at this point, I, I just want to express my tremendous respect to uh, the healthcare for the homeless providers, uh, such as those at St. Michael's and um, the researchers at the MAP Center for Urban Health uh, Solutions. Uh, so uh, many political leaders have put vulnerable homeless people in unused hotel settings, although that's starting to come to an end. But now, as you alluded to, Michael, we had in our country, and I don't know about yours, an eviction moratorium that's ended so many more millions at risk. So, you know, we need the best data again to see, for example, how many people who were experiencing homeless uh, were COVID positive, how many were hospitalized, how many died, are those risks of a hospitalization and, get, and death getting worse now, or is, is the variants keep coming? You know, how many are getting vaccinated and, and getting boosted? The initial studies we had from Boston, and I, at this point, I got to mention my dear lifelong colleague, Dr. Jim O'Connell, who, who heads Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, uh, they did heroic work testing and vaccinating uh, homeless populations in our city and state. But we, we need data to see, you know, when these crises come, how well do we protect everybody, but particularly the most vulnerable? So that's just one example of where more reliable evidence-based uh, research uh, could could help guide policy going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the questions, Dr. Ko, that often when we go to a funder, we're speaking with government, is they say, show us the numbers, right? Show us the data. 
exactly. how do we know is it that big if we're going to invest we have to know we're investing in the right right thing too right so that definitely right. counts i mean and most of the time it it uh what verifies what we already know we we know that access to health care unfortunately for our most vulnerable usually uh that access is blocked or, or they have very little access unfortunately we're trying to increase that but we show the data we often drop stats of uh, people that are unhoused go to the er emergency rooms five times more than someone who's housed right because they just don't have that family doctor option or they're not sure i see it in, in our the shelters we run um our staff don't have an option because we don't have a healthcare worker 24 7 on site which is very costly and, and maybe not necessary every time a client says I'm feeling like this or this. We have to call 911. Call and they're sent to the emergency. They come out, an ambulance comes out because we can't take that risk of not being right with a medical situation, or sorry, of being wrong mm -hmm. uh, with that situation. You think of that cost of the ambulance, the ER, the trauma on that client having to go through that. Where if we had medical support, the nurse even there to look at and say, "No, you're good. You know, you can stay well, here, I rest up, and do that." Yeah. I like that example, Michael, and there are countless ones. I mean, how do we build better models of care and testing and prevention? How do we make it efficient? How do we do this without spending inordinate sums of money? So the example you just cited is a great one. I mean, you know, anybody can see that that's really not efficient, but it's all we got right now, and it's just not acceptable. So I'm just hoping with more attention to especially what academia can do, what researchers can do, what collaboration can accomplish, we, we can have better ways of caring for vulnerable people going forward. Absolutely. And Dr. Ko, with you doing the work that you're doing, with your passion uh, and pedigree, I have no doubt that you know we are well on our way and you're going to drive that work. Good luck with your talk today. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be amazing and you're going to leave a lot of people walking out of that inspired. Uh, mm -hmm and in thought of what part they play in ending this crisis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. What a great honor, Michael. Keep up your good work. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Well, you know, we often talk about on this podcast, health and homelessness, right? And you heard Dr. Ko there say we need to revise that model. Listen, not only will it save lives, it will save money. It's a better way to go, right? Think of what I just gave that example of those ambulances coming to Blue Door daily doing that, people going to the ER daily, how expensive that is, never mind the impact on the client having to go through that all the time. Um, there's got to be a different way to do that. Listen, if you can today, St. Mike's, that is where the talk is taking place this evening. Uh, share this podcast and, and go and check out all Dr. Ko's work. He has uh, a massive uh, body of work. Check it out. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We will see you next time on the way home.